Today, my guest is David Hernandez. He's the Director of Business Development at Reva Solutions, or as he likes to describe it, a professional troublemaker, which I, I like that description better. Uh, he's an industry chair for the ACTIAC Emerging Technology DevOps Working Group and volunteers with both our artificial intelligence and blockchain working groups. And then David also helps organize some of the breakfast committees and health IT events for FCA, another great organization. And today, today I am dressed in a shirt that's fancy because I know David normally does, but today I'm, I'm out fancying you, David. How, how did that happen? Um, you, you've got really good timing. You happen to catch me while I'm uh, road tripping my way through the country. So I'm, I'm currently call, speaking out of uh, Colorado Springs, managed to find a, a really well-placed coffee shop with, with some great background. Uh, and so, you know, as I was running around my day, this is, this is kind of what I had on. Uh, I, I will tell you though, just, just to make you happy, I did bring three suits on this trip because I actually had a little <laughs> conference in Vegas last week. Um, and so I did have my little three piece look going on. Just, nice. just not, not today. Not um, today. And as you know, I've got my personal assistant with me as well. So uh, that's right. This special guest, special guest for the episode. There we go. Our special co-host for <laughs> session. So David, for those who haven't had a chance to get to know you like, like I have uh, and talk about a, a variety of topics, uh, explain who you are, you know, what your background is and what you, and what you do. So I think it might actually be easier to go with what I do and, and, and the background. I think who I am is, a, is like, a, like a <laughs> constantly flu. It's a fluid question because, you know, I, I, I give off different impressions to different people and I feel like I, I love to do so many different things. So, you know, people who know me from cigar smoking or from happy hour events may not know some of the things that you know about me, which is the fact that I can like totally geek out on board games and video games and things of that sort. And the back of this laptop screen has a bunch of stickers of Star Wars and you know, Jedi's and all sorts of other things. So there's 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 a little bit of um, eclecticness to 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 that that story. Uh, but in terms of you know where am I from? Um, you know, came with my family from Cuba. Uh, grew up in Miami, Florida. So kind of went to Havana 2.0. And um, if you've ever been down there, it's its own little foreign foreign country. Um, and then you know, late 20s, moved out to Los Angeles. Um, from there, I moved to Texas, moved back to Los Angeles. And in that timeline, I actually had the privilege when I was, I don't know, like 20 years old, almost 20, 21 years old. Um, I graduated college pretty early um, and I had the privilege of being able to travel a lot of the U.S. And I got to see about 42 states during that time. And I've now seen 47. Uh, so I'm only missing like I've basically the entire continent of the U.S. with the exception of Rhode Island. Um, and, and so been able to see a lot of things and then finally you know made my way out to dc a little over a little over four years ago now and and you know fell right into this entire world so it's it's been an interesting ride wow i i did not realize i guess in all the conversations we had that it's only been four years for you so from a work perspective what did you do before that then so I've always been in BD. That's the other kind of interesting shift though, because that was never my, my original game plan. My bachelor's was in biology. I was actually a pre-med student. And so I, I was a very nerdy kid. I think I graduated, I got my bachelor's by the time I was 20 years old. Um, and, and then, you know, my whole plan was to go, you know, go to go into med school and, and then while I was in college, so I did a lot of dual enrollment in high school. So I left with like my associate's degree, come in at high school. I, and then I get into college and I thought, oh, I've been busting my butt all this time. I got this. I'm good. But wait, there's parties and I've got a little more freedom. And I actually blew my scholarship in the first year, um, paid off my, my, the rest of my, my way through my last year of school by working. Uh, and I was, did a few different jobs. But the main one I was doing at the time, I was actually parking cars as a valet at a condominium where I would work like these eight hour on eight hour off shifts. Like I would come in from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then come back in from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, and I did that for three or three days in a row. Wow. But in that timeline, there was, there was one of the residents just kind of liked my spunk, I guess. They used the word in Spanish that they says, uh, it, it says, tiene la pila puesta, which basically means you've got batteries on, which as you, you know, I think is a good definition. Yep. Um, and, and he asked me to come in and, and help him out. He had this small startup firm. He needed somebody to kind of help him kind of get things going and, and, and up and moving. He was just manufacturing products in South America, distributing them in the U S. Uh, and I came in, I helped kind of take over that warehouse aspect of the role. And then 
he realized, hey, you're pretty good on the phones. I'm going to send you out to go open up new clientele, which is where I got the ability to start traveling. So I'm going to school and I'm wrapping up my classes while working. And I was making pretty, pretty solid money uh, for, for a kid at my age. I think I was making more than my dad at that point. And, and so I had this, this internal debate here or dilemma of, all right, do I, do I go to school? You know, do I keep, do I go back into med school and start for the next six odd years or so, right? Like, but my residency and all those other things, or do I just kind of like live this lifestyle of being young with a, you know, decent paycheck, not like out of this world, um, but very solid and traveling at the same time and having that travel funded by my work. And so I got to have a very diverse experience. I got to actually see a lot of parts of the U.S. that most people never see, like very, very rural areas um, combined with some of the big cities. And, and yeah, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And then that got me into the sales environment. So when I got tired of living my life on the road, because I was out of, I'd sometimes spend 20 days out of the month out of, out of town. Wow. Um, and I, I'd had an apartment where my friends probably partied in my apartment more than I did. But, um, <laughs> I decided to come, you know, come back in and I started getting into, uh, I actually got into sales management um, and then burned myself out of that because I was doing 80 hour weeks. Uh, that's actually the project that took me to Corpus Christi. I went to take over a failing market. And, and then we, I, I think we had like a 200% year over year increase in revenue or something that sort. And, um, and then from there, we ended up shifting to, to, you know, kind of like the large enterprise sales space. So I worked for some market research providers, actually a little bit in the procurement space. I worked for Gartner and, and then I shifted my way over to DC. So wow. it's definitely been interesting. So, so, so that it does lead me to the, the next kind of question of sorts is, you know, what made, I mean, was it just from the sales perspective that you got into the IT consulting realm? Um, yeah, actually it was. So um, IT was an area that, that I really wanted to get more, more involved in. Um, it was interesting because I had spent some time working on, on the human capital end of Gartner as well. Um, they had like a kind of a research arm on that front. And, and it was really interesting because a lot of the conversations were focused on cultural and organizational change and how do you, how do you, you know, operate in this new environment where everything is starting to shift, organizations are becoming more matrixed. How does that impact, you know, some of the, the initiatives that you're trying to drive? And, and apparently it is perfectly aligned to all the modernization that we're dealing with right now in the IT world. So um, it was a really good shift. I really, and like I said, I, I wanted to get more involved into the IT realm because I just saw um, that's the, the, that was the direction where a lot of change and a lot of just the, you know, the environment, the, the corporate environments, and also just, you know, we're starting to shift into. So one of the things that I did to actually get myself up to speed was I actually tried, because I, I, you know, it's not an area that I had a lot of background in. So a lot of, it's interesting because some of the jobs I've been in have always been in brand new verticals. So I've, I've always been able to kind of catch up a little, you know, I don't want to say fast, but at a, at a, reasonable enough pace. So I wanted that this is something that, you know, when you're trying to get involved in the IT space, it's so competitive that you can't just come in blind. So I actually talked to someone from Red Hat. I was suggested to read the Phoenix project as a way to get a lot of context on what are the big issues that people are dealing with in this environment. So I did, um, went in, read that, um, you know, and, and got, it gave me a lot of great context, read a little bit on agile development and kind of the differences between agile DevOps and what's going on in that realm. And, and, and then, you know, I went in and I started uh, interviewing for, for a role at Excella uh, under um, a great mentor, his name's Sean Duguay. But, uh, but yeah, so I got to meet Sean. And what I did to convince him that he needed to hire me for this role was I went out and after having my initial interview and kind of, I guess, proving I wasn't an idiot, um, at the base, that's kind of like how I think how he responded back to me um, is I actually went out and did a survey. I, I looked up because I, I was actually originally wasn't even going in for government. I was going in for his commercial uh, practice. And so they were looking for a commercial rep, rep and that's what I was going for. So I went in, I did some market research on all the Fortune 500 within the tri-state area. So I looked up Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and I pulled up North Carolina because there's some pretty major businesses within the area. So I just wanted local enough. Um, profiled them. 
did and then picked a, according to different verticals. Across those verticals, I identified key trends that are happening in the AI space across those specific verticals. And then I profiled one of those, one business from each of the verticals where I outlined all of their key stakeholders <laughs> and like just stuff they're working on from their Q4 financials. And this was like a 20 page document I sent over their way. You know, so this is basically my business plan for year one. Right. Uh, and, and that's how I got hired. <laughs> <laughs> and when I get, when he brought me in, he says, Hey, our commercial practice is way too small. We're, we're going to put you in federal because we don't want to waste your time kind of a thing. And, and that's how I got in. I, I had wow. no, no plan or gain or vision for how I was going to get into the federal space. <laughs> um, and, and, it, and it was, it was completely like, this was so alien to me when I first got in. So yeah, it's, I've, I've, it's, I've actually, it's been a much shorter run than most people actually think when they meet me. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, I, I've, I've known you for almost most of those four years and you come across like day one uh, on the ball, but I mean, I think that's an important personality trait um, for those of us who, who just need to get the job done. Right. Yeah. You, you got the, you've got the, the will to make it happen. You, you just do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I think that was, that was probably, you know, how do I say this? And this is an interesting aspect because I think we're seeing a lot of issues nowadays when we're talking around, like, how do we create more diversity or more opportunities for people from diverse environments? And, you know, sadly, it's, it's something that, you know, you, can, you can't change how you were raised or where you came from, right? So there's certain institutional knowledge you're never going to have if you just didn't grow up in those environments. Mm. So, you know, it's something that it's, it's, it's not great and, and we, we should work on better ways to drive greater, you know, how do, how do we increase that institutional knowledge? But at the same time, for those of us who don't have it, we also, it's like, well, am I going to let that stop me or slow me down? Right. And so if, if I already know I'm, I'm, I'm competing against somebody who has more, more of that background, but I know I could, I know I could still do the job better than them. That just means I got to work that much harder to, to, to get up to at least get to a reasonable level where I could be competitive. And, and it's kind of, you know, when I was that hungry, that's what got me there. And now, now I'm able to reap some of the benefits of that because, you know, now people know who I am. They've recognized me. They've interfaced with me in different environments. So I no longer have to sell myself as hard as I used to because there's not, you know, I've, been, I've had the chance to prove it. But when, when you're going in there without any proof points, that's kind of what you got to do is just, you know, make it easy for everybody else by showing them what that hard work looks like, I guess is the, the best way to describe it. Yeah. Well, and then you, in turn, you're giving back through FCA and other organizations. So, right, once you... I've seen it in you. Once you've achieved what you were trying to do, you you don't keep looking forward. You're also willing to help some of the others who are having a harder time with it. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, because I think the easiest way I describe it is is in that sense. It's just like kind of like a almost like a like like almost on a karmic level. It just I feel like if I do good onto everybody else, eventually the good comes back my way. It's it's a lot easier to just be nice to people than it is to <laughs> try to. <laughs> You know, I, I know it can be it can be a little tough because if, when you're getting a lot approached by a large amount of people, you know, you you also you've got to figure out your bandwidth. Yeah. But but trying to do the best I can to just, you know, hey, if I know you're working on something and I know people who do it, why not just share that information with you? It might not serve me any purpose today, but who knows, like two, three years down the line, we might be interfacing together and, and I did you a solid and it pays off, you know, and right. and I, I was just at a, like the conference I was at this weekend. A lot of the people that I was interfacing with, they aren't even my accounts. And people actually thought I worked those accounts because I was <laughs> interfacing with some of, you know, some, some decision makers within, within, within certain areas of government. And no, it's just, why wouldn't I want to meet these people and get to know them and know what they're about? I mean, heck, if they're, if, if they're good people and I, can, I, could, I could interface with them and have a good time and even better, if I could provide something of value, you know, who knows where you're going to next? So let's, like, let's just be good to each other kind of a thing. That's a great approach. So yeah. along those lines, I mean, now that you've been working your way through your career, what's something you've seen? I mean, maybe maybe this is the area, but is there something that you've seen that if if they came to you, David, and said, you have the power to make a change or you have the power to make us reconsider the way we're doing something today, what would that something be for you? So it's that's an interesting one. So there's almost two ways I'd want to go with this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go first with a point that I brought up a little bit earlier when we were talking a little around the concept of diversity. Uh, and I also, I want, I think I, I want to bring that one up because it's a very common point nowadays with some of the things that have happened in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more awareness around 
you know, how do we, how do we create, you know, more diversity and provide more opportunities to people from different backgrounds or different heritages or different genders, uh, and just use that, that, that collective mindset to actually improve our creativity and what we can put, what we can bring to the table. And, you know, the, what I tend to see a lot of times, not just in government, but across the spectrum industry too, is we want to be diverse, but we fail to forget that it's much more important to be inclusive. So just because I hire somebody who's different doesn't necessarily mean that they're, that I've created the environment for them to think and not and react differently or to accommodate their differences. Uh, because not everybody has the same back. Like we, we joke common sense is not common, but that's very true. Common sense is never common because common sense to me is based off of my collective schemas and experiences and how I've interpreted the world my whole life. And you might have a different set of upbringing and traditional traditions and belief systems that are common sense to you that would never, I would never have thought of. Um, in my culture, growing up in Miami, right, uh, it was a common courtesy for, for, for men to give women a kiss on the cheek when they said hello. That became an immediate no-no the second I moved out and a, and a big HR issue. Right. So, you know, common sense dictates you shouldn't do that, but not where I came from. And that was in the United States. That's why I joke about the whole foreign country thing. So, you know, how do you, how do you educate and, and create more of that inclusivity? How do you create environments where, you know, somebody who comes from a different background doesn't have to act like everybody else just to fit in um, and is accepted for, for, for those differences, I think is a, is a big challenge to achieving that true diversity that people want to get to. I think like, you know, diversity should really be more of the end state and really diving towards how do we be inclusive rather than the other way around, which is, you know, let's just hire everybody and then we figure it out later. And then we wonder why we have such a rotating pool of, of, of these talents. Wow, that's a great answer. That's a great thing to consider. You're absolutely right. Because you, you, you yeah, we've been doing a big push for uh, diversity hiring and ensuring that we have, you know, differing uh, backgrounds and whatnot. But you're right, that that is only the first step. And uh, it's good to remember there's more work to be done. Yeah. And I, and, and I say that because, you know, having having had my like my upbringing and my background, it's like sometimes, you know, as I as I realized, as I like made my way up the, the corporate ladder, I started looking a little less like everybody else kind of. <laughs> right. uh, and, 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 you know, it's just like, you get this vibe, like, all right, well, am I allowed to be this way? Am I not allowed to be that way? Should I say certain things about like, do I, you know, when I was a younger person in a group, was I allowed to tell people I was salsa dancing last night? Because they might think that I'm just, you know, being a party animal or something, um, you know, without understanding kind of like the, the, the concepts of all that. So it's, it's an interesting one. If you want, I'm also happy to complain about federal contracting too. So. Oh, no, please, please. I, as a federal worker, I love to hear people complain about federal contracting. Yeah. So, so one of the ones that we, I know me and you have chatted about this before, but I would say um, a big one is, is just, you know, how, how can we create a more open environment? I've, I've seen some really amazing procurements come out where you, I think when you see some of the top tier agencies that are really performing at a strong level from a DevOps perspective, from an IT monetization perspective, what you've noticed, what you'll notice about their procurements is that they're they're highly competitive. And what I mean by that is they release a lot of information. Mm -hmm. You can see, you can look at their epics, you can look at their IT architecture, you look at their diagrams, like it's all out there, right? Doesn't mean that I still, as an organization, as an industry, shouldn't be meeting with the stakeholders and understanding their issues because there's context to, to really getting insight on, on on how that agency works. So there's homework to be done. But you know, that stuff should be like your your architecture should be table stakes like that that you should create as even another playing field as you can for people who actually have the skill sets and the talents to actually demonstrate that talent to you and not just be unable to do that because we don't know you know like we don't we don't know what your api structure is so then I, i'm going to miss a critical point on the rfp kind of a thing so like um you know i think being able to be more bring more of that openness into the competitive environment is great um i think it's a challenge because when you're talking about phase procurements or you're talking about you know doing more case studies versus past performance and incorporate mm -hmm. technical demos or, or presentations that requires the source selection to have a certain amount of skill set right they need to have knowledge of how procurement works they need to have knowledge on their systems um, a lot of technical knowledge that maybe not everybody in leadership has so i know it's not easy um, and you got to have a lot of people on the same page you got and you got a lot of bandwidth to be able to read uh, the possible qu large quantity of proposals. Yeah. 
I mean, that one, that one, there's, there's, there's workarounds for it because I mean, that's kind of why you do the phase piece at the very least to reduce some of those elements. Like you want that phase one to be not too heavy, um, but you're right. And so it, it's not like I have the magic wand on how to answer it. I would just love to see more of that. I'd love to see mm -hmm. at least a drive towards people trying to, to, to really, you know, kind of open up the, 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 the environment a little bit more and have those conversations uh, to, to let diverse thoughts and ideas come in um so because and I, I like i said i'm not gonna i don't prefer not to name any specific names um but you've seen some good ones i've seen some good ones and, and i think those like when you see that the more competitive those environments are usually the better the, the work that they get coming out of that's true and and you you mentioned fa the phase you know procurements that's an anomaly it's not everywhere and uh, there are many organizations so don't even know how to do a phase procurement which would take some of that pressure off. Well, and and some of those phase procurements also, I mean, I've got criticism on how some of them operate. I've had some where it's, you know, they give you the phases, but then phase one to phase two is a one week turnaround. Right. And it's like, well, then am I, do I what was, you know, like. It wasn't the, really, it wasn't really phased. <laughs> well, it was, it was phased for, for the government side. It made it easier for them, um, but not necessarily for the people competing on it because now we're, we're all struggling again to prepare and, and provide something of value. I mean, it's, it's a fine line because you don't want to give someone too much time either. Mm. You've got to kind of balance that out. Um, but yeah, there's, it, 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 you're right. It's, it's, I think it's a growing trend. I think we're seeing more of it um, and you're seeing more openness. I think one of the coolest ones I saw, there was a group where they actually created a shared folder, kind of like a, like a SharePoint or a Google doc, like a, like a you know, um, like a Dropbox where all the procurement documents, the drafts were were on there. So like the drafts out, all the stuff that helped reduce their Q and A hmm. because everybody who was going to participate was already providing comments and they released it basically, I think two or three weeks before the actual RFQ. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so they were already getting the input from everybody ahead of the release of the RFQ, which then limited the amount of like delay they would have to have if a hundred people came back with questions. So did they put that out? I, I, well, we can talk later. I, I'd be very interested to hear how they did okay. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was based off the RFI responses. So that's, that's okay. the, that, the group that they shared it with. But yeah, that's, it, it was a cool, it's a re, it was a really cool idea and they had a lot of participation. So there was a lot of people who were able to see those docs. Yeah. Hmm. Um, wow, that's that's really interesting. Well, so, so I'm curious, where, where do you see yourself? Where are you heading? Where are you heading or, or where is the work that you're doing headed? What do you see in the future for coming up? So the idea here is um, the idea here is very much how do we, you know, where do we go to next? I think for me, myself, I've, I'm, I'm in an interesting place, right? So I have the huge privilege of working for a company that is honestly in a bit of an enviable space. Um, you know, Reva Solutions, we are still an 8A small business but we've had a tremendous amount of success in the last year, um, last year and a half or so. We've won $50 million um, web modernization PPA for all of USDA. We won a $70 million financial system modernization at HHS. Another 30, I think like a 36 mil, you know, um, IT contract, a development contract for another agency at, out of health and human services and nice. and and one more out of the Department of Labor. Yeah, so we've gotten, you know, we're, we're in this solid, and we just want to see it on stars three. So hmm. we're in this solid place where we're small. We know we're not going to be small much longer because we're probably going to be sized out pretty soon. Um, but we've, we've got, we've started, you know, we've gotten the right amount of wins in place and we've already set the strategy for, you know, beforehand, we're, we're starting to shift ourselves as an organization to be and operate in kind of that, that big space. And so it's a really cool place to be because you normally, you know, so many small businesses, they, they don't do very well. I think it's like a 95% fail rate for small businesses shifting into the, the, the that mid space for an open realm, right? Well, a lot of them just, they fail. Um, and, you know, I've, I, I think we've, we've put a lot of the good pieces in place. Our, our CEO happens to be, you know, someone who was a good friend of mine before I ever came on board. And, and I, I got to see his, his vision and understand everything he was building towards before I ever had to come in and actually do the work. And so he's been planned, like this is something that's been in place for, for time, right? And, you know, before we won this work, we actually hired 
incredibly skilled individuals to build out like an internal solutions practice. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. You know, and so now, you know, those guys, those, those guys were able to put that together and now we're winning work. So now we have the large scale past performances as well that we're going to be able to leverage in the experience. And now we can start transitioning that into even more. So, you know, the pieces are in place. We've also, you know, we've started to kind of develop our, our different practices. We've, we've, we're expanding our team. And, and so there's a lot of moving parts, um, but there's also, you know, some good organizations. So I think uh, I, I, I have my work cut off for me because there's a lot still left to do. So it sounds like based on, based on the wins you guys have had though, you, you've got a, your work cut out for you. And then of course, like you said, to make that transition, successful transition to a mid-level company means you can't let off the gas. You've got to keep it going. Not in the slightest. And then the hardest thing is that, you know, we, we're, like I said, we're still small. So it's, you know, we're looking at that short-term tactical, hey, what are the kind of short-term opportunities? Like, there's the short-term opportunities we can win now, leveraging that status. Right. But then there's the longer term, you know, we have to plan now to be full and open. So can we, what can we do to start being competitive in that space, right? And, and go up against a Deloitte or even a Booz Allen or, or anybody of that nature, uh, because that's going to be some of the work that we're probably a year from, you know, two years from now, we're, we're going to be competing on. And so we got to put those pieces in place now and think about that as well. Uh, and maybe even try to see if I could swing one or two of those sooner. And so, you know, that's, that's a scary, that's like a David and Goliath story that's to think about right there. So it's definitely not, um, it, that's, that's what I mean by the work cut out is, you know, it's, it's, we're in a good place, but it doesn't mean that it's going to get any easier. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, David, I want to thank you for bearing with me as we did this interview today. And I look forward to seeing you when you get back to DC. No worries. No, if anything, uh, I, I have to turn it around and have to thank you for your patience because <laughs> you, you definitely, I, I, I think that hopefully the connectivity issues make for a fun, for a fun, uh, uh, zoom. We could, we, maybe we could use some of those like old school, like eighties, like transition slides <laughs> between, in between the different times I, I, I fade out. Um, but no, I think, thanks a lot. And, um, you know, probably the next time you see me, I'll look more like my LinkedIn profile than I do. Like, like I just came back from the gym, but it's all um, good been great man i appreciated it and uh and you know thanks for thanks for giving me the time all right see you soon cool man